In this video, I'll be talking about a less studied cellular pathway called mannose metabolism. Our body depends on different sources of energy such as carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Glucose, a simple sugar, is one of the main resources that we depend on. Glucose can be stored as glycogen or we can break it down through processes like glycolysis and the TCA cycle in order to produce ATP. Since most cellular processes require ATP to function, we need glucose in order to complete these cellular processes in our body. Mannose, on the other hand, is a simple sugar as well, and it is derived from glucose. It's a carbon-2 epimer of glucose. Mannose is important for protein glycosylation in our body. Protein glycosylation is the addition of sugars onto proteins, and the purpose of this is to hydrate these proteins and to protect them from protein degradation. There are many other reasons that protein glycosylation happens, but these are one of the main reasons that it does. So let's get back into our main topic of mannose metabolism. What does the pathway look like? First off, we have a cell here, and we have glucose molecules that start entering our cell through glucose transporters. As you see here, the grape transporter, and there's also going to be other hexose transporters like mannose transporters. So initially, this glucose enters the cell, and the glucose is then phosphorylated with hexokinase, and it becomes glucose 6-phosphate. Then, glucose 6-phosphate has two pathways it can take. It can either be stored as glycogen, or it can go through PGI, phosphoglucose isomerase, and be converted into fructose 6-phosphate. Then, fructose 6-phosphate has two options as well. It can either go complete the glycolysis pathway and eventually produce ATP for the cell, which is very crucial for the cell to stay alive, or it can go through the enzyme MPI, mannose phosphate isomerase, and this will convert fructose into mannose 6-phosphate. So then our mannose 6-phosphate can actually become mannose 1-phosphate through phosphomannomutase 2. PMM2. This mannose 1-phosphate is then utilized to add onto proteins in order to biosynthesize our glycoproteins. Glycoproteins are very important for the cells to stay alive, and they're involved in many different cellular pathways. So if we can't produce an efficient amount of glycoproteins for the cells, they might not be able to stay alive. So this is the overall pathway we see for mannose that is derived from glucose and how it's added onto glycoproteins. There is a second option that mannose can be metabolized and that is through exogenous mannose. So we can produce mannose 6-phosphate not only from glucose but also from mannose that comes in to the cell from the outside. So if our mannose comes in from our diet for example, it would enter the cell and this mannose can then go through hexokinase and be phosphorylated into mannose 6-phosphate. So ultimately, we see mannose 6-phosphate in two different pools. One that's derived from exogenous mannose, and two, those that are derived from glucose molecules. In this case, we have seen the overall pathway and how mannose 6-phosphate can be derived from two different sources. So what would happen if there were inefficient supplements of these enzymes like MPI and PMM2? Would this cause any sort of disruption in this pathway and what would that lead to? So I will now discuss a couple diseases I have found out about and researched on how lack of MPI and PMM2 enzymes, for example, can lead to different symptoms and disorders in the human body. The congenital disorders of glycosylation, known as CDG, they are well known to be disorders that arise from lack of glycoprotein production in the cells. Since we talked about how glycoproteins are very important for the cell to stay alive, if we cannot produce enough of these glycoproteins because there are a certain type of errors in the pathway that we mentioned before in mannose metabolism, then this can lead to several disorders. 
The ones I'll talk about is MPI CDG and PMM2 CDG. Initially, what happens is that genetic mutations in MPI and PMM2 lead to the deficiencies of these enzymes. So if we don't have enough MPI and PMM2 to convert different intermediates, then we're not going to be able to complete the mannose metabolism pathway and produce glycoproteins. So for MPI CDG, let's go back to our pathway. If we don't have enough MPI, that means that we cannot produce enough mannose 6-phosphate that is derived from glucose because we can't convert this fructose to mannose 6-phosphate. And we know from previous studies that the majority of glycoproteins have mannose that originate from glucose. So only a smaller portion actually come from exogenous mannose. Because of this, the cells are not able to produce enough glycoproteins. And so this MPI deficiency leads to the CDG disorders. Now, what possible treatments could come in handy? They found that if we add mannose outside the cell, so if we give patients mannose supplements, this exogenous mannose can enter the cells and they can start producing mannose 6-phosphate and eventually make up for the loss of this MPI. Since we can't convert glucose to mannose 6-phosphate, they can make, a, make that up with the extra mannose that they add to these cells. So then this process of uh, giving patients mannose supplements were actually found to be beneficial, and patients started showing less symptoms for the disorders. So ultimately, if you have too much mannose 6-phosphate, however, this can lead to feedback inhibition. So they had to make sure to keep the dosage of mannose supplements the right amount, because if they overdose patients, that would mean producing too much mannose 6-phosphate, more than you need to produce glycoproteins. And that's going to trigger feedback inhibition and go inhibit glycolysis. Since glycolysis is very crucial for the cell to stay alive, we do not want this feedback inhibition. So the dosages must be taken care of at the right amount. The other disease that I want to talk about is the PMM2 deficiency. So these patients are deficient in PMM2. They cannot benefit from the mannose treatments that worked in the MPI patients because even if you add more exogenous MPI into these cells, exogenous mannose into these cells, you're going to be producing a lot of mannose 6-phosphate, but you can't convert that into mannose 1-phosphate because you don't have PMM2. So there's no point in increasing this mannose 6-phosphate. That's only going to go and inhibit your glycolysis pathway. So instead, there are current studies that are aiming to increase mannose 1-phosphate levels in cells instead of trying to increase this mannose 6-phosphate. So then if we have more mannose 1-phosphate, that should be able to benefit glycoprotein production. Aside from these very commonly known congenital disorders of glycosylation, there are several other diseases that mannose seems to be involved in. But of course, there are current studies going on, and we don't know a lot about these different roles that mannose and mannose metabolism plays. So I looked up some current articles in the 2000s, and I found a few on mannose and the CDGs. So one of them found a potential biomarker, N-tetrasaccharide. They found this in all patients with CDGs with PMM2 and MPI deficiencies, for example. Another paper talked about how they created a mouse model for PMM2 congenital disorder glycosylation. And this is important because then we can use these mouse models in order to test different treatments for PMM2 CDG. And then this can benefit patients in the clinic. And if you're also interested in learning more about the details of the metabolism pathway as well as the impacts of mannose on cells, I suggest reading these two papers. They even talk about the metabolic origins of mannose and glycoproteins. And finally, the roles of mannose in other diseases, aside from the congenital disorders of glycoproteins. I found some work that was done in immunology. They found that mannose, for example, induces regulatory T-cells, 
it suppresses immunopathology, and Mano's metabolism was found to be important for T-cell differentiation. Additionally, Manos was found to be associated with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So these are very different from the CDGs that we talked about, but it's very important to look at this um, variety of diseases that Manos could potentially be involved in. In fact, Manos was also found to impair tumor growth and enhance chemotherapy. So this is actually because of the capability of mannose 6-phosphate being able to inhibit the glycolysis pathway. So if we go back to our pathway, I'll mention how this works. You have this overflow of mannose, let's say, because they used excess mannose to suppress tumor growth. So if you imagine the cell as a cancer cell, and you add a lot of mannose, that's going to increase mannose 6-phosphate, like we discussed previously. And if you have a lot of this mannose 6-phosphate, in addition to the sufficient amount you need for glycoprotein, because you only have a limited amount of enzymes of MPI and PMM2, so the excess is going to accumulate here, and that excess is going to inhibit glycolysis. So this inhibition is going to create the cell to cell death basically so this in this inhibition is going to cause a cell to die and eventually your tumor growth is going to slow down if we treat mannose to cancer cells and so that's like the short basis of how that paper went in depth and if you have any questions in regards to one of these papers or any part of the video please feel free to comment below and if you're interested in learning more, I suggest reading through these articles, and there are several other more online. And thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed.